In this tricky topic, we're going to look at the biological treatment of depression, specifically using drugs. A number of psychological disorders have been shown to correlate with brain changes and specific neurotransmitter signaling pathways. Therefore, many treatments focus on drug therapies aiming to restore neurotransmitter signaling back to biologically normal levels. And it's important to note that the drugs used to treat psychological disorders are the second most prescribed drug class in Canada, second only to drugs used to treat cardiovascular disease. Depression has been shown to correlate with a decrease in serotonin as well as other monoamine neurotransmitters in the brain. And many therapeutic approaches have used drug therapy to try and restore monoamine neurotransmitter levels within the synaptic cleft to a functional level. There are four main monoamine neurotransmitters that have major roles throughout the brain. Decreased levels of these monoamines have been shown to correlate with depression. And these are serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. They're classified by the fact that they share common synthesis pathways and all possess a common amino functional group in their chemical structure. Each is an amine containing only one amino group. Each of these specific neurotransmitters have very widespread distributions throughout the brain. When we first look at serotonin, we see a wide distribution throughout the midbrain, frontal cortex, and throughout the entire cortex, as well as the cerebellum. Following that, if we look at dopamine, it has a lot of diffusion throughout the midbrain, as well as the frontal cortex. Norepinephrine, again, like serotonin, is found throughout the entire brain in all major structures. And then finally, epinephrine is mostly concentrated in the brain stem. A decrease in monoamine neurotransmitter release in the brain is believed to be the main molecular mechanism by which depression manifests. Currently, there are three main antidepressant drug classes that work to increase monoamine neurotransmitter levels in the brain. Those three classes are monoamine oxidase inhibitors, tricyclic antidepressants, and selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Each class differs from one another in two main ways, the first being its specificity and the second being its mechanism of action. The next question following this would be how do these specific drug classes increase monoamine neurotransmitter levels in the brain? But before looking at how these specific antidepressant drugs work, we first need to review the basic mechanisms guiding synaptic transmission, reception, and the degradation of monoamine neurotransmitters. If we look at our synapse, what we see in the order of events of synaptic release is first the monoamine neurotransmitter being loaded into presynaptic vesicles in the terminal of the presynaptic axon. These synaptic vesicles are then taken to the membrane where they fuse, resulting in the release of these neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft. And at this point, these monoamine neurotransmitters will bind to postsynaptic receptors, causing a response in the postsynaptic cell. Following this, these receptors will either become saturated or they release this monoamine neurotransmitter back into the synaptic cleft, where it will then be reuptaken by reuptake transporters. Once back inside the presynaptic cell, these monoamine neurotransmitters will then be degraded by monoamine oxidase. And monoamine oxidase is an enzyme that breaks down any monoamine neurotransmitters so that it can be resynthesized as the cell needs it, and then the cycle continues. If we look at our first drug class, this is the monoamine oxidase inhibitors, which reduce the actions of the enzyme monoamine oxidase. As just discussed, this is a major enzyme in the breakdown of monoamine neurotransmitters. By blocking monoamine oxidase, there will be an increase in monoamine neurotransmitters available, ultimately leading to an increased release in the synaptic cleft and subsequent receptor binding, and therefore a greater response than normally elicited by the lower levels of these monoamine neurotransmitters when monoamine oxidase is allowed to be active. The second class is tricyclic antidepressants, and these specifically block presynaptic reuptake of serotonin and norepinephrine in particular. When this happens, this causes again a buildup of these monoamine neurotransmitters, specifically serotonin and norepinephrine, in the synaptic cleft, and subsequently increased binding to the postsynaptic receptors. 
Finally, the third class is selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And these are really interesting because there's a lot of evidence put forth that suggests that the monoamine neurotransmitter serotonin is especially and more significantly than the others involved in depression. This drug was developed that selectively targets serotonin, resulting in the selective increase of serotonin in the synaptic cleft. The aim was to result in a drug that still produced beneficial results for the treatment of depression while reducing side effects. Due to the blockage of reuptake pumps that transport serotonin, we have an increase of serotonin in the synaptic cleft and then an increase in the binding of these postsynaptic receptors, trying to bring them back to the normal endogenous levels or the normal endogenous effect of serotonin that would be present in the brain of an individual that is not suffering from depression. In summary, there are three major drug therapies for treating depression, and each will have its own unique selectivity and mechanism of action as we just reviewed. They all result in an increase of neurotransmitter in the synaptic cleft, thus strengthening and prolonging each neurotransmitter's respective postsynaptic response. In terms of monoamine oxidase inhibitors, they selectively target monoamine oxidase and result in an increase in the level of all monoamines in the synaptic cleft. Following this, tricyclic antidepressants target the reuptake transporters specifically for serotonin and norepinephrine, resulting in their increase in the synaptic cleft. Finally, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors are selective to serotonin reuptake transporters and only result in an increase of serotonin in the synaptic cleft. Before concluding, it's important to note that there can be many potential side effects associated with antidepressants due to the nonspecific drug effects in the body. This is due to the route of administration of these drug classes. When a drug is taken orally in pill form, it must enter the bloodstream via the gastrointestinal tract, where it is then free to diffuse throughout the entire body, including the brain, which is the desired target in this case. If we look at these three drug classes, they each have specific side effects associated with them. The first being monoamine oxidase inhibitors, which interact with many foods and drugs, specifically over-the-counter drugs, which can cause dangerous increases in blood pressure. Tricyclic antidepressants also have effects on other neurotransmitters, like acetylcholine and histamine signaling pathways, leading to autonomic nervous system effects like dry mouth, irritability, confusion, and constipation. And then finally, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors can produce side effects like agitation, insomnia, nausea, and difficulty achieving orgasm. That concludes this tricky topic looking at biological treatments of depression.